welcome to the creative community. I'm your host David Starkey and today we're going to visit the Santa Barbara Museum of Art, look at two exhibits, Left Coast and Living in the Timeless. Let's go inside the museum. Left Coast. Um, this is a, an exhibition that you've put together with pieces that you've collected for the museum over the last five years. Yes, I've been here now for about five and a half years and during that time with the assistance and support of our director Larry Feinberg and the entire museum staff and community and board we've been able to make some very fine acquisitions mm -hmm. through both gift and purchases, strategic purchases. And so when I was given this space, I decided to do a recent acquisition show, but of course I wanted to focus it down mm -hmm. into something thematic. And so I chose Left Coast since uh, the show kind of, uh, well, it definitely focuses on artists who have exhibited or grown mm -hmm. up or been schooled in Southern California and uh, also focusing on artists of repute who have mm -hmm. had major exhibitions in the last few years mm -hmm. uh, and then some younger uh, right. people too so it's always fun to kind of mix things up mm -hmm. and be as diverse as you can but work within some sort of framework well you know when i hear left coast i, I think of things that are both positive and, and negative so the <laughs> negative would be you know, it's left out you know it's it's <laughs> it's, it's away from from new york um, and, and yet, the positive, it's, it's left-wing, it's more avant-garde, it's more interesting, maybe? How, how do you see that word? Well, I think, as we've seen from the entire Getty Pacific Standard Time right. initiative that we took part in several years ago, uh, it's all those things. Uh, the left, or the Southern California, because it was sort of left out of the dialogue mm -hmm. that was going on in New York, in New York, many things could happen out here that really couldn't happen elsewhere. Right. Um, but For instance, what would you say are the main well, things I'd say uh, the developments that you saw with artists who could use materials and processes that were more involved in automobile mm -hmm. making or engineering, uh, the use of plastics, mm -hmm. um, some performance that actually gave rise to a whole genre of video art mm -hmm. that started in Southern California. Mm -hmm. uh, granted, we don't have any video uh, or performance in the show, but definitely some of these works are evocative of the history of that mm -hmm. environment, sort of coming from that environment. As you collect for the Santa Barbara Museum of Art, we just mentioned the Getty, this huge, enormous, extravagantly funded institution. What, what's, what, what's your goal? What are you trying to, to make happen here in our town? Well, when I first came in, I was looking quite a bit at the history of the Santa Barbara Museum of Art and uh, what it rose from. A lot of it came from what was going on at the library and mm -hmm. the gallery there, uh, which was more of like an art center where contemporary artists were showing. But then we also came, we rose from the Wright Ludington collection mm -hmm. and a few major collectors who gave their works to the museum. And so it comes out of this history of, of collecting. But what fascinated me and continues to fascinate me as I look at the exhibition history is the strong focus on artists from California. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I came in, I noticed that we had sort of dropped the ball a little bit in the 80s and 90s, uh, collecting artists of, uh, from Southern California. So I wanted to rectify that. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel right now that we're in a really good position. Mm -hmm. I, I feel very comfortable with the collection. We've received some amazing gifts. We've been able to make some very good purchases at the right time. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I don't know, I think that's something that we really need to continue to, to watch. And, and that includes not just artists from LA and even from Northern California, uh, but also local artists as well. And you'll see a couple works by mm, local artists to see, too. Yeah. Well, let's, let's take a, a little walk around the gallery. And I know we, people would love to see everything if they could, but we don't <laughs> have time. Well, sh show me the first piece that you're interested okay. in talking about. This piece by Larry Pittman. We acquired this piece in 2009. And at the time, 
I was looking intentionally for an older piece, and we found this fantastic uh, painting in a private collection through a dealer, and uh, we ended up getting it for a very good price, uh, which is also good. Uh, but Larry Pittman is one of the first artists from Los Angeles who came up in that environment but decided not to move to New York mm -hmm. in the 1980s. And this is very important. Uh, many artists, when they came up through the art world in Los Angeles, felt, and, you know, rightly so, that the commercial environment there couldn't support right. what was going on. And so many of them had to move to New York where they were shown quite often and, and could actually get by and live and work as an artist. And so this piece, uh, more importantly, comes from a specific time in Larry's career. He just had a major show at Regan Projects down in LA uh, last fall. It was a fantastic exhibition. Uh, he, he shows quite a bit, he's very famous. Uh, but this piece is actually from a time when uh, he was thinking a lot about the AIDS crisis. He, he doesn't like to assign specific meaning to his work, but of course you can find a lot yeah, of Yeah, and in fact it. I was just about to ask you to come over here and walk me through the <laughs> symbology of this piece, but you don't want to do that probably. Well, I can tell you that the, the owl image, uh, it was very interesting when I brought this painting into the collection, our curator of Asian art, Susan Tai, said, that's the dying Buddha. Mm. And I said, what do you mean? She's like, that is the image of the dying Buddha that's very traditional throughout uh, Asian art history uh, and mythology and, and whatnot. And so what you see is this owl who is laying down. You don't see owls laying down ever. Um, and the, his feathers almost replicate the pattern of the, the folds of the robe in the traditional image of the dying Buddha. And in the traditional image, there are subjects that are weeping at the Buddha's bedside. And so you see this represented mm. almost through these teardrop-like shapes at the bottom of the piece. Uh, of course, there's lots of other things going on. Uh, the arrow signifying this way out, which also might refer to, in a very uh, tongue-in-cheek way, death. Mm -hmm. um, the number 69 the number is featured 69, prominently. Which I won't go into. <laughs> okay, for a family show. <laughs> and also, too, Larry comes from a Latin American uh, background. His mother uh, was, I believe, uh, Mexican or Colombian. I, I, I'm sorry, I forget. But uh, he and his partner travel often to Mexico, and they've become very engaged and interested in a lot of the motifs, the design motifs that you see throughout Mexico. Um, so sometimes you can find that in his work. Uh, there are icons like dripping candles that kind of come in and out. The silhouette is something he uses quite a bit, and this is something that looks very kind of mid-century, mm -hmm. the, the tall steeple-like right. structures, but they also have these faces. That are all cartoonist. Yeah, and, uh, there's a lot going on yeah. in his work, and Fantastic. this particular piece, I think, you know, you see the, the microscope there. Which uh, yeah, it's know. nice to see this piece featured so prominently as you're walking to the exhibit. Yeah, it's great. It's fun. When we first acquired this, we put it in a small gallery that features recent acquisitions. But I did want to bring this one out again because it's nice to see it in context with so many of the other artists mm -hmm. that uh, came up with Larry right. in the art world. But also, too, just giving it a little more breathing space in a different context actually really does change the way it looks. Let's take a look at some of the pieces in the next gallery. So what are we looking at here? So this painting is by Jack Goldstein. And Jack Goldstein went to school in LA. And this is one of the things that came out during the Getty Pacific Standard Time initiative exhibitions, is that one of the reasons Southern California was such a hotbed for artistic activity is the fact that we had all these art schools, or schools where uh, mm -hmm. artists could go and, and train professionally and, and get their degrees. And many of them were teaching at these universities. Jack Goldstein actually came out of uh, what's now known as CalArts, as did many of the artists in the exhibition. And uh, Not surprisingly. <laughs> yeah, not surprisingly. And he quickly rose to fame. He moved uh, right to New York and his paintings from the 1980s are particularly of interest to me. I actually worked with him while he was still alive uh, to do an exhibition of paintings from the 80s. And so 
this is one of my first acquisitions oh, for the wow. museum. So it looks to me like a, almost like an infrared uh, photograph at the top. Yeah. This piece actually is from either 1989 or 1990. It's, it's late in his body of paintings. Uh, he is also known for doing films and performances, uh, but this was sort of at the end of his painting phase. And Jack was very prophetic in a way. Uh, this image, to me, reads as something through night vision goggles, and a lot of his imagery kind of referred to warfare imagery mm -hmm. that actually came up much later. Like if you remember the, I remember when we were having the exhibition that I created at the Luckman Gallery um, with Jack when he was alive, I remember that a lot of his paintings looked a lot like the images that came from the invasion of Iraq. You know, those sort of night mm -hmm. sky images with things right, exploding. Right. But that was, you know, those images came up well after Jack's paintings were done. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's very prophetic. And he was also very interested in film. And so what it you It looks see, like the sprocket, too. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, very okay, perceptive. Right. And so it, it kind of references a television screen. Yeah. It's painted with this opalescent, metallic-like yeah. paint that almost doesn't have a color um, or might shift in color. But it is that sprocket shape. And he would often repeat that shape along the edges, uh, uh, kind of like film yeah, sprocket. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just arresting, because <laughs> you want to look up here, and you keep getting drawn back down to this empty Yeah, spot. and what's great about these paintings is the way they were done. You see the variation in color, but each color is a different layer of paint. It's not paint that's been mixed together to form an abstract image. It's an abstract image that's created through just layering mm. different colors of paint, almost like digital, di how digital imagery is composed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, now, we're standing right next to another piece that's really fascinating. I, you know, you feel like you've walked into the lucky penny for <laughs> a minute, but it's, it's, it's all made of, of Lincoln pennies. Yes, Lincoln pennies, and these were made uh, during a specific time. I believe it's from 59 to 95. Uh -huh. uh, and Robert Wexler is an artist who actually went to school at UCSB, and he showed around uh, the neighborhood a little bit. He, of course, was at the university, and he also did a couple things for what was then CAF in Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. And he's also done a few things with our education department. And I was sitting on a grant panel down in LA, and I became reacquainted with his work through this penny project that he was doing. And it wasn't necessarily this work, but something else that sort of this work took him to, which is examining images of pennies that are so high res that you can almost get in there and feel yeah. like you're surrounded by the penny. It's fascinating. Well, it's, what, he's sort of cut little slots in there? Can you Yeah, he's cut little sort of, technical um, aspect? he's punched little slots out and he's, he's constructed this geometric mm -hmm. uh, structure. It's architectural, right. it also references geometry. Uh, he titles it by using the number of how many pennies that he incorporated into the piece. And um, I should let you know that there's one penny in there that's 2014 that's a signature penny. Uh -huh. And he has etched his signature onto the penny. And Somewhere deep. I challenge you to find <laughs> it. <laughs> no, and I'm, I'm looking through it. I'm realizing that this is a solid block of pennies. It's a really great piece, and it's not just a formal wonder. Right. It, there's so much more to his continuing investigation of the penny. This thing that has almost become extinct right. or obsolete is the subject of many a congressional, uh, <laughs> <laughs> for better or for worse, uh, discussion. Right. Um, and also a huge part of American history. Well, and I, and I look over here, the, the title of the piece is The Mendicant, the Mendicant which means The Beggar. That's interesting. So, you know, I hadn't even thought about that part of it. <laughs> <laughs> this is a painting by the LA-based painter Kevin Appel. He also teaches painting at UC Irvine. And this particular piece is from 1999, from a very iconic series of the artists, where he was looking quite a bit at architectural software. Uh, and I think it's hard for some of us to remember that this kind of technology 
wasn't around forever. But it was this amazing way where architects could come in, similar to the Alice Acock exhibition that we mm -hmm. had. Uh, mm -hmm. She was looking at the same thing earlier on. Uh, but Kevin was looking at this, at this architectural software and also combining it with his interest in mid-century architecture, mm -hmm. particularly case study homes. And so he just uses these as influences, I think, to create these abstract compositions that at the time were very seamless. I remember writing about this exhibition uh, in a journal that no longer exists, Art Issues, and the work was so stunning at the time for its, it was almost breathless mm -hmm. or breathtaking. Mm -hmm. And that uh, these beautiful sort of shapes that almost put the viewer into this computer program. Yeah. And, and at the same time, I can almost see a dandelion exploding with the exactly. seeds about to take off. Yeah, yeah, it definitely has that sense of organic landscape, even though it's done with pure geometry. Mm -hmm. But then again, because it is hand painted, uh, it really does have that special quality yeah, that painting yeah. really uh, gives the viewer. We've walked down to the end of the gallery to see April Street's Beetlejuice, and then the subtitle is The Shoulder and the Bow. Um, what, what's this one all about? Well, this is just another form of abstract painting, and I thought it was important to talk about this piece, uh, primarily because artist April is one of the younger artists in the exhibition, along with Summer Roman, who we'll speak to in right. a little bit. Um, but also to show the different ways that artists are dealing with abstraction right now. Uh, this particular piece, I don't know if the camera will pick it up, but it's not necessarily paint on canvas. There is paint on canvas involved, but what you also see are layers and layers of black nylon over acrylic and hosiery. Um, and that is over an initial painting on canvas. Mm -hmm. And the way April actually achieves this is through a very performative process. Um, I like to think of her historically in the lineage of artists like Helen Frankenthaler. Uh, she stains her canvases, but she actually does it by wrapping herself in paint-soaked bed sheets and kind of enacting this sense of restlessness mm -hmm. on the canvas. And so what you get is a record of this performance but then she's also And that's layered. buried deep beneath all this nylon, though, It's very right? deep yeah. beneath the nylon, and the imagery is beautiful mm -hmm. just by itself, but she's, she's layered and layered it with extra things. Mm -hmm. She's wrapped some of it in extra nylon with pigment. Um, she's tied some nylons together, right. and then she's sort of wrapped the whole piece at the end with this black nylon mm -hmm. that you can sort of see-through, and it creates this moray-like pattern, mm -hmm. but she's also poked holes in it, like which little is kind, runs of, in the stockings, kind of yeah. naughty, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's even a bobby pin in there, nice. but um, yeah, I think it's a really great piece yeah. and quite beautiful. It really is, and, and, and you would think with these materials it might not be, but the more you stare at it, my eye just keeps getting drawn back to it. Yeah, and also, too, when you light it, uh, the shadows mm. become part of the piece mm -hmm. from the different layers, so it's kind of a mystery, but mm -hmm. at the same time uh, evocative of sort of a feminine sensibility, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. I also like. Yeah. Um, I also really had fun putting it next to the Lyle Ashton Harris photographs that we have in the right. show, where Lyle has kind of dressed himself up mm -hmm. as a woman mm -hmm. and also put himself in white face. Mm -hmm. and that's also very performative, yeah. so I sort of think of this as my... So as you're curating, and obviously this comes to mind, this piece next to this piece, mm -hmm. uh, you're imagining of you're kind of walking around um, in, in sequence, or just to be drawn from here to here to here? Well, you know, on paper, and my assistant Patty, who will walk you through Beatrice Wood, mm -hmm. uh, will <laughs> testify to this. On paper, you work things out, right. and you get to know a space eventually, and right. you're pretty confident that things will go where, the, where you plan them. And so you do set up these relationships. Things always change mm -hmm. in the process of installation. And then also, too, once it's up, you form these new relationships mm -hmm. that you didn't even suspect. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this show, we did a little bit of that, and there are some sub-themes, um, like um, Americanness, what it means to be an American. Right. Um, there's portraiture, there's uh, the mediated landscape, there's obsessive, almost compulsive drawing, mm -hmm. um, or process-oriented drawing. 
Um, but then a lot of these relationships kind of form that you, you don't expect. And they're not necessarily linear either. Um, you know, you try to put things in, in relation to each other, but something in, in the other room may relate to something right, back right, in the corner. Right. Yeah, and you see people looking and walking back. I know I do yeah. that a lot. Well, let's go back into the, the first room and take a look at a, a couple of, of drawings. So I'm walking by here. Um, Kim Jones, I feel like I'm looking at a, a battlefield map or something like that. You are. <laughs> this is by the New York-based art, artist Kim Jones. Kim Jones actually made his reputation as a performance artist in LA in the 70s. And he did some quite controversial performances. Uh, he had an alter ego by the name of Mudman. And he would go around, walking around uh, the streets of mostly Venice or, or the city of LA. He did a couple walks along Wilshire Boulevard that were very famous. And uh, he would strap on this network slash backpack of sticks and he would be down to his skivvies and cover himself with mud. And a lot of this comes out of his familial history of um, the men being in the military mm. and serving in several wars. And Kim himself served in the Vietnam War. And it was a very treacherous uh, time, of course, and a treacherous experience for him, as well as many others, as we know. But this particular series of drawings that he does, another part of his practice, comes from something he did when he was a kid. He would do these little war drawings. Mm. Um, and what I love about this work is it's so process-oriented. Uh, a lot of it is, you know, he has a, there's a little legend that perhaps I could share with you that sort of tells you what the different figures mm -hmm. are right. and what you see are tanks moving in and then he'll maybe erase that and the other side will sort of venture into the same area. So I don't know, I just, I find his process mm. fascinating. He actually hangs on to his drawings for many years mm. and you can see there's fold marks right, in them. Right. So he folds them up and he travels and he sticks them in an envelope on an envelope and takes them out and works on them some more. <laughs> well, you know, when you say process-oriented, when I think about that as a, a writer and a writing instructor, for me that means that the, the ultimate product develops during the course of the writing, that you, you don't know what's going to happen exactly. a, ahead of time, and that's, that's kind of exactly. what we're looking at here. Yeah. Kim also has done a little bit of writing uh, as well, but I think it, it's really something not to be missed. I yeah. think it'll be. Well, yeah, as we go from, from piece to piece, we're thinking, okay, this is going to happen because of this. So the show yeah. is inspiring a lot of uh, related Absolutely. activities. Absolutely. We try to program around the exhibitions. And this event actually came up sort of by accident. I was in New York several weeks ago, and I ran into Kim. And he's like, hey, I really want to come to L.A. And I'm like, well, why don't you just come speak right. Just right. in Santa Barbara? So it's sort of a nice, happy happy accident that that happened, but I'm really looking forward to it. Let's look at, at another drawing that's, that's quite different, and we're going to talk to the artist herself, uh, Summer Roman. So we're sitting now in front of Arista Loki and Kazarina um, Summer Roman. <laughs> um, t tell us what it is that, that you've done here. Well, these drawings are based on these um, some images that I came across a few years ago from a book of sort of some old school micro photographs mm -hmm. of plant stems. And I had never seen such imagery before. And I, I was also on the side, you know, doing some drawings and some fiber sculptures that were very obsessive and bio, with biomorphic forms and a lot of circles. And when I found these images, I just felt sort of an automatic, immediate relationship mm -hmm. and sort of <laughs> connection. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I have to use this as some source imagery. Um, it just felt like I, I kind of fell upon a private language of plants, and that was really exciting to me, and sort of just studying a little bit their system of organization mm -hmm. and um, was sort of the basis for the drawings and also just what will happen with the dialogue between studying those and translating them, enlarging them, mixed with sort of the input of my own process and my hand, and sort of so those two forces kind of coming together mm -hmm. in a way. Well, they're so detailed, and, and, and clearly they do kind of reference your original source, but 
they're really different too, aren't they, Julie? They are. When you get in on them really close, you see this very uh, almost childish kind of scribble or like doodle-like scribble, which was really fascinating for me. Uh, uh, they, they seem so scientific, almost like photographs from a distance, but then you get up next to them and they have this really great kind of activity that I think we can all relate to. I love that you say that about that because it's definitely those two things coming together, I think. And, you know, changing something from a microscopic view to something bigger where you kind of, a little bit larger than someone's head, it kind of makes you discover something. Yeah. I'd love to know um, why it was important for you to have Summer in this show, Left Coast. Well, it's interesting. Summer was a rather late addition, a recent addition, and I came across her drawings in a show that Jane Deering uh, in town, right. gallery in town, great gallery, had, and I was so taken with these works, and I thought that it was such an interesting addition to what I know of your practice already, the sculptures that I'm already familiar with. Uh, Summer has actually worked with the museum before, so it was really refreshing to see these and also to think about how they would relate to some of the drawings mm -hmm. in the show, like the Russell Crotty, right. who is now in Ojai, like the Kim Jones, even like the Mike Kelly, for instance. And also, too, the fact that Summer's uh, so young and fresh, and if you don't mind my saying, she just graduated from UCSB, <laughs> And uh, <laughs> Go catch us. You know, to kind of keep abreast of the fact that there is so much happening in Santa Barbara, right. and it's always important to keep our eyes trained on what's going on mm -hmm. locally as well as what's going on, you know, right. in, larger, in a larger geography. So uh, would you like to stay and continue to make art in Santa Barbara, or do you feel like you're going to have to move somewhere else? That's a good question. Um, I'm definitely going to be in town for the next year, and I think the, the, this area in general is, is a great place. Um, being pretty close to LA is important, um, but I love the environment here, I love the geography, that's very inspiring, um, but kind of taking it year by year, mm -hmm. but I think I'll stay on the left coast. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. Yeah. Well, tell me a little bit more about your, your place in the left coast. As, as Julie said, you're, you're young, you just graduated from college. Um, where do you see yourself in relation to some of these artists who have been around for quite a long time? I mean, first of all, it's just a, quite a privilege to be in the show and to be among um, many established and emerging, but you know, a little ahead of me. It's, it's just such a privilege to be in the show with them. And I think I'm thinking about that still, kind of where my place is and how the, these drawings fit, but I definitely, there's several pieces in this room that have a very obsessive mark-making quality, um, like the Russell Crotty and Kim Jones. Um, so I think I see that, and just being part of that dialogue mm -hmm. of the region of Southern California, um, being on the younger side, coming out, coming, just coming out of school. Yeah, I mean, I think maybe there's the interest in the land there's might be something part of being um, on this side of the country in the environment. Mm -hmm. Oh, the landscape is quite different, yeah. and I think you do see it show up um, in certain aspects of, of art from Southern California or made here. I was also thinking in terms of your sculpture how, uh, how it might relate to Ken Price's ceramic yeah. um, sort of biomorphic shapes as well. That just sort of occurred to me. Yeah, it's, you know, in a recent studio visit with um, David Pagel, actually, the writer in L.A., he mentioned Ken Price to me, and um, it was actually sort of a new, I hadn't known of his work, and a few days later, I came to see the show, Ken oh, show, and, and there, was a, our beautiful there was a Ken Price, you know, right in my drawings, and it was kind of a funny thing, because he had mentioned, he wanted me to look at his work for my sculptures, and I was like, oh, oh interesting. Yeah, oh, <laughs> maybe not a coincidence. <laughs> Well, it's been a real pleasure to talk with you, Summer. Thank you for coming. Thank you. And Julie, thank you so much for walking us through Left Coast, which will be up until mid-September of yes. 2014. Yes. Uh, it's always a pleasure to talk with you. Oh, and you. Thank you so much for coming and for your support.
So uh, I've wandered over here with Patricia Lee, curatorial assistant in contemporary art. And Patricia, the show that you're doing is Living in the Timeless Drawings of Beatrice Wood. Um, now, this is really a fabulous show. It's kind of a lot of comic um, moments. There's a lot of erotic moments. Yes. <laughs> um, and it, it, it seems to be a lot based on the life of, of Beatrice Wood. So tell us a little bit of background about her and the show. Yeah, um, the show really came about um, about a year ago. Uh, we received a rather large group of drawings, uh, mostly drawings, works on paper, from Francis Nauman um, and his wife, Marie Keller. And he is a longtime sort of scholar uh, of Beatrice Wood's work. And he was sort of entrusted with many of her drawings after her passing uh, in 1998. Mm -hmm. And so he generously donated a large body of work to us uh, in 2013. And so the show sort of came up out of that gift. Um, and it's also supplemented by works in our collection mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Um, so that's sort of the, the nuts and bolts of where it came about. But uh, as you might know, Beatrice Wood has a very long-standing sort of tie to this region. We've got the Beatrice Wood Center for the Arts. Exactly. Yeah. And so that used to be her old home uh, up in Ojai. And a lot of people in the area are very familiar with her pottery, which mm -hmm. is really what she was known for, especially during her own lifetime. Um, her lusterware pottery. Uh, some of it may look very functional, so plates, bowls, things like that, teapots. Um, but she also did figurines, um, these sort of hand-molded figures, as well as wheel-thrown pottery. And with this large body of drawing, uh, I guess we wanted to look at this other side of her work that maybe a lot of people might not be familiar with. Now, I've heard a lot of stories from artists about how she was a larger-than-life character yes. up there. Yes. <laughs> and I'm sure you know many of those as yes. well. Paint for us a picture of, of her maybe in her later years, and then we'll, we'll uh, go back to 1819. Sure. So, I mean, just, you know, I unfortunately did not uh, get the chance to meet her when she was alive. She lived to be 105. Mm -hmm. um, she passed away in 1998. Uh, she lived about... I would say a good chunk of her later years in Ojai. I believe she moved there um, in the 1940s, I believe. Uh, and she has been sort of a longtime resident in this area. Uh, but again, she was a larger than life uh, figure. Um, she went by the nickname Beto, which I think many people might be familiar with that name as well. Um, and she, especially in her later years, dressed in saris. Uh, she had a deep connection with India. She traveled there uh, several times, I believe on behalf of the State Department, the US State Department, um, almost as a sort of ambassador, a cultural sort of ambassador. Um, and they really took to her colorful sort of lusterwear right. there. And, um, so she was sort of a lifelong uh, flirt. She was very, very much constructed um, and lived in this sort of persona that was very playful. Um, but something that I've just sort of learned reading through her uh, autobiography, I Shock Myself, which is still uh, for, in print, I believe, or still for sale at least. Um, she's just a really fascinating woman. Um, you know, she sometimes what she's saying and uh, sort of expressing in words doesn't always necessarily translate um, to what you see in her drawings. Um, and I think one thing I find so interesting about her is, you know, she was born in the 1890s, and so she grew up in New York, very much a product of the Victorian era, right. born to affluent parents. And it's interesting to me to see how she constantly is negotiating that Victorian upbringing, that sense of propriety, um, and yet exploring these very sort of socially taboo kind of Well, I, as did so many people who kind of came of age sure. in the 1920s. And, exactly. You know, I mean, that's sort that's of the crux of modernism. <laughs> yeah, really but it's really yeah. fascinating to see it play out, you know, in on the, paper. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Well, let's start by looking at some of the drawings. And we're just going to kind of sit here and, and let viewers uh, take a, a glance. But I know that you wanted to start with this one over here, sure. which is kind of atypical. Yes. Uh, the, the first sort of drawing that starts the exhibition, I put it sort of on its own wall. Um, because it is this sort of anomalous kind of work, it's really more of a uh, study drawing. It mm -hmm. is literally uh, a 20-minute sketch that 
Beatrice Wood did as a student um, at the Academie Julien in Paris. Um, she, convinced, she was able to convince her parents to let her go to Paris um, as a teenager to study drawing. And it's a very academic sort of drawing of a nude uh, female figure. Um, it's actually called Sketches of Me at Julian's, which is really interesting. 20 minute sketches of me at Julian's, which almost more sounds like a, a sort of male friend of hers rather than this sort of art academy. And, you know, titles were always something that she had a lot of fun with. Um, I know she titled a lot of her works after she made them, and that was part of the process for her. Um, but I wanted to start the show off with that drawing, um, just to show uh, visitors that, you know, it wasn't that she was completely untrained, and I think, you know, some of the drawings might appear sort of naive and almost childlike, um, and during her lifetime, you know, a lot of critics didn't really care so much for her drawings. Um, some critics didn't care for her uh, figures, the, the ceramic figures either, um, just because they did seem a little sort of naive or um, less refined than maybe her pottery. Mm -hmm. um, and so I did want people to know that, you know, she did have this stint in the academy, but she quickly sort of moved away yeah. from that. And you have a great quote from Duchamp on the yes. wall there. Tell us about that. Yeah, um, so she, when she went back to the US, uh, she was in Paris, but the, world, the First World War brought her back to New York. Um, so it was interesting because a lot of Europeans uh, sort of came to the US to sort of escape the war. And she too sort of came back to the US at the same time. And because she uh, had studied in France, she had a pretty good command of the French language. And so she was able to uh, make, you know, sort of fast friends with a lot of the uh, French artists, uh, diplomats, et cetera, that were living in New York at the time. Uh, and so she met Marcel Duchamp that way. Uh, they quickly became friends. And he actually opened up his studio to her uh, so she could work on drawing. She actually was trained as a, an actress. Mm -hmm. And so uh, art, fine arts weren't sort of her first objective. Um, and so she sort of continued to work on that um, with Duchamp and in his studio. And, yeah. yeah, and so it, it, the, the, the quote is, never do the commonplace rules are fatal to the progress of art. And yes. she seems to have really embraced that. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Um, you know, interestingly enough, her interests early on were in sort of romantic commercial illustration. Um, that's sort of where she sort of saw herself going in terms of her own drawing style. And you do see elements of that in some of her mm -hmm. works. Um, a lot of these sort of doe-eyed uh, female figures, things like that. Um, but he really encouraged her to, um, again, throw away the rules, throw away maybe what she learned at the academy. Uh, so you don't see a lot of really naturalistic figures. Um, you see a lot of figures that are fragmented. Um, and I think there are a lot of influences that she's sort of um, melding in her works, whether they're cubist or surrealist. She really sort of came of age in that period. Mm -hmm. And she never really stuck to one particular style. And that's what I think is so interesting about her work. Um, but at the same time, maybe has made her work kind of difficult to grasp for a lot of well, people. Well, take us through a, a, a couple pieces here in this room so that we can kind of see that. And it's not really a progress because I, I, I looked and it's like, well, okay, here's 1989, yes. here's 1932 right next to each other. It's not chronological, it's not necessarily thematic, right. you're saying. Right, so that's um, one thing that I noticed was there was no point for me. I, I started looking at the work and I noticed that she was going back to a lot of the same, um, not only themes, but literally the same forms, the same characters in some of her work, um, you know, spread apart by 40 years or so. And you see similar forms mm -hmm. repeat themselves. And she actually talks about that. Um, and she wrote to a friend when she was 103, and she said that drawings allowed her to live in the timeless because she could always draw herself as this young woman. And of course, you know, that's a very playful thing to say, especially <laughs> when you're 103. Um, but that's, so it didn't make much sense to do a sort of linear progression um, or a thematic one for that matter.
So show us uh, what's something that you yeah. think we should so, look at more closely. Um, I tried to do a few groupings and pairings. Um, so there is some mm -hmm. sort of uh, curatorial hand here, but uh, I wanted to pair um, some of her tiles. Um, so she did. I did include some ceramic work, which I'll maybe talk about in a minute. Um, but you do see a lot of uh, similarities and sort of affinities between the tiles and the two-dimensional drawings. Um, you have tiles like Female Figure from 1945, uh, which almost looks, you know, it's basically as if she's drawing on the tile um, with glaze and pigment. And it does have a very sort of um, drawing-like quality to them. Um, and you can even see, you know, the work right next to it, which is called Why. Um, most likely, it's sort of a, a self-portrait, mm -hmm. a very abstracted kind of self-portrait. Um, you know, shares some of the same green shading as in the tile that was done, you know, I believe, I think 40 years prior, mm -hmm. 30, 40 years prior. So, um, and then other tiles in the exhibition, um, so, you know, female figure is a much flatter kind of tile. But I do have other tiles, such as uh, Making the Rounds, um, which is, again, a, a play on words, uh, which is sort of this central uh, buttocks surrounded by these stick figure men. Um, and it does have a much more sort of sculptural quality to it, even though it, it's a tile. Um, and then uh, there's some interesting pieces on, on the back yes. wall behind us. Uh, so behind us, um, you'll see several works in the show that deal with the spinster figure um, or the sort of religious counterpart, the nun. Mm -hmm. um, and she was really fascinated, I think, by this sense of chastity. Um, you know, she talks at length, uh, even as a younger woman, you know, about her various affairs with men who, you know, she later found out were married and things like that. Um, but f after her second husband, Steve Hogue, passed away, uh, she really lived about the last, I would say, thir almost 40 years of her life as a as widow, essentially. Uh, she never had children. And so she actually saw herself, interestingly enough, as a spinster. Um, she also had a very strict mother and a very strict aunt, which I learned. And I believe, you know, she also sees some of that in them mm -hmm. as well. Um, so you see these spinster figures. Um, in the other gallery, there's a work called uh, A Nun's Dream, which is one of my favorite works in the exhibition. And, you know, you have this central nun figure, and she's surrounded by uh, all these nude, very fleshy figures sort of circling her in her dream. Um, and it's, you know, it makes you wonder if these are things she's also thinking about and, and sort of internalizing and dealing with, yeah. There's a, a bit of lithography over there. Uh, yes. Tell me about that and why that's important to be. Yeah, um, I think Beatrice Wood was never one to stop experimenting and she continually, um, throughout her career, experimented in new mediums. Um, she began really with painting, which you don't actually see a lot of in this exhibition. Mm -hmm. Um, you do see some early watercolors, um, but you know, for the most part, she, when she moved into ceramics, um, you know, that again was another new medium for her, and she was almost 50 years old when that happened. Um, lithography seemed like a very natural sort of transition from drawing for her, mm -hmm. and I think she was very interested in just trying out this new process. Um, so after she moved to LA in 1928, uh, soon thereafter she met Linton Kistler, who is a famed sort of lithographer in the Southern California region in particular. And together they worked to uh, reproduce some of her drawings. Um, and so we actually have uh, one of those early drawings called Holiday mm -hmm. Um, as a drawing, but also in its sort of lithographic mm -hmm. form as well. And they're slightly different and modified, of course, but it's nice to sort of see them side by side. Yeah. What do you say we walk across the sure. hall and go take a look at the next sure. one? So, Patricia, we're walking from one room that has a blue accent wall to one that has a, a pink accent wall. Why is that? Yes, uh, I'm glad you asked me that. Um, that is something that I did deliberately. Um, I know that a lot of the works in the show are drawings, and so I did want to um, sort of off-play the sort of paper color and include some color. 
Um, and I chose blue and pink uh, because Beatrice Wood uh, lived in a pink and blue house, actually, in Ojai, and also to highlight um, the sort of binary that she always saw between men and women um, was something that you see in her work uh, even early on um, into you know, works from the 90s. So you see a lot of this very sort of dichotomous male-female split. Um, she did this in a lot of her works. Uh, one of her works is, uh, I saw a tall man standing at the door. And uh, it's actually her husband, Steve Hogue, her second husband, Steve. And uh, the scene is literally split in between um, two. So you have this female figure on one side and this much taller man on the other side. Um, and she did view men and women as having very distinct uh, roles. So. Well, the series we're about to look at is, is very much a woman-woman uh, yes. series. <laughs> and and it, it, you were talking about the fact that she had this work in, in kind of design and illustration. And, and this does look like some magazine illustrations yeah. from the period, possibly. Exactly. Um, we have six works from the Touching Certain Things series, which was produced uh, between 19... 32 and 1933, and these were made uh, after she took a trip with her friend Helen Freeman, who was a fellow actress, and they went to Holland to actually hear um, the sort of theosophy uh, leader, uh, Krishnamurti, give a, uh, he led sort of a camp in Holland, and they were invited to attend. Uh, they went to Holland, and the drawings that you see here sort of chronicle some of their adventures, like riding a bike, for example, um, but also some sort of fantasies, I think, that Beatrice may have had. So some of these works, you know, run that line between reality and fantasy, and I think they're definitely uh, running that fine line between both. Um, and what I love about these works is, you know, in certain uh, drawings, like this, you know, you see that very almost pinup-like quality to the works, and they almost look like calendar girls. Um, but in other works, and you know, this is why I kind of paired works like this or put them in close proximity to one another, is that you see how the form is kind of not quite fully formed, like you see above. You know, here we have complete rounded modeled figures. Uh, but in the same, very same series, you have two women again, but you know, almost this very minimal form formed by these open lines, uh, really just suggesting form. Um, and you see other examples of this in her work um, in this gallery as well. This is the drawing that I mentioned. I found at the door a tall man. Um, and again, you can see how she uh, keeps this sort of female figure on one side, the man on the other. Uh, and you see this elsewhere, it's a little less obvious here, but she also often um, drew her female figures as softer, a little more shaded, a little rounder. And the men um, often took these very angular forms. Um, and you can see that more clearly in some of the earlier drawings. You know, I'm looking at, at these faces and, and I'm getting a, a blast of German expressionism a little bit. Is that an influence on hers? I think there are many influences. I think she was in, in some ways aware of what was going on around her. On the other hand, I think she um, liked to not really train or sort of copy or... Um, so she never really fit into one mold, right. but I do see many influences, so. And what else, I mean, you've been looking at her so much, who else would you say she was looking at as an artist that kind of filtered into her work? Um, you know, I see a little bit of uh, surrealist influence, um, Pacabia in, mm -hmm. in particular, um, with one of the works over there called uh, The Restaurant. Um, you see a lot of these overlapping forms, um, these sort of bodies that morph into one another. And I do think that's a very sort of surrealist influence. Um, and also this concept of automatic drawing that we associate with surrealism. Um, I don't know if she was necessarily channeling it so obviously or consciously, mm. uh, which also seems very yeah. surrealist. <laughs> uh, but she um, 
actually I, I learned this, that she would produce a lot of her drawings uh, upside down. So she would first do an initial sketch, you know, normally, and then she'd turn her paper the other way. And it was because she didn't want um, sort of this preconceived idea of what she was sort of setting out to draw to dictate the actual form it took. Um, so she actually drew, you know, the rest of the figure upside down, um, which may explain some <laughs> a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you, you mentioned this drawing right behind you yeah. in, in the other gallery. Yes, this is a nun's dream from 1996. Um, and again, here you can see the central sort of nun figure. And this is one of the more sort of um, finely rendered works in terms of color and shading. And you do see a lot of this shading um, really early on too, which I find quite interesting. And um, around her, you see generally, as far as I can tell, mostly female nudes surrounding her. So again, linking back to perhaps um, that sort of interest in, in the female body. Um, well, as we sort of dig into her psychology a little bit, the, yeah. the female nudes are, seem to be mostly kind of uh, unconcerned by what's happening, yeah. and, and the, the nun has got these claws yeah. that look like she's coming yeah. straight out of hell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, clearly, you know, they seem very sort of restful. This one almost looks like she's asleep. Yeah. Um, and yeah, she does have this sort of angry, um, uh, sort of appearance and, and pose. Um, and I think that goes with this idea of, you know, fears and anxieties, um, knowing what's proper, what you shouldn't do versus, you know, what you want. Um, you see a lot of that at play um, in her works. And that's one thing I really kind of learned as I put this show together was, you know, it's not just, it's easy to look at these works and think, initially that they're all sort of puns and they're, you know, lighthearted and whimsical is often a word used to describe her work. And I think there's a lot more there. Um, you know, some of the works are deeply sort of sad and um, other works, you know, you can feel her anger and her jealousy and rage. You know, she was, um, you know, scorned by several of her sort of closest uh, relationships and, and men in her life. Um, and you can see that, you know, playing out on, on paper, so. Well, let's, we're, we're, we're coming sort of to the close of our, our tour, but we've got another wall yet of, of drawings by Beatrice Wood. Um, what is something that you would want to, a, a piece or two that you want to point out to viewers? Sure. Um, I guess I would probably like to focus on uh, some of these works here, um, I think they also are quite refined. Um, you can see how she's using uh, pencil, not only graphite, but also colored pencil. Um, really nice shading as well. Um, but here's an example, and this is the work I was talking about earlier, restaurant, um, where you see these forms, you know, this man's face in the foreground, um, and you see this sort of almost phallic nose um, really blending in with the other figures and sort of tables and other forms in the work, um, which I find so unique. Um, and interestingly, this work also, the way she depicts faces is I think quite fascinating. Um, you see this sort of um, face with the sort of line running down it elsewhere in the exhibition. You see this sort of, um, for lack of a better term, a unibrow-like figure with this sort of um, angled eyebrow, um, not only here, uh, actually on the nun in a nun's dream, uh, you see it in the ceramic figure work bureaucracy as well, and she's doing this throughout her career, and it's interesting to me that she has this sort of set of characters and the set of, of how she wants to depict people um, that she always comes back to. Well, I, I love to see the dates attached to these things too, because there is a timeless quality of there, you know, yeah. occasionally we'll have some reference to the external world, but, but frequently they seem to be living in this world of her imagination. Yes, yes. Um, and that's another good point is that, you know, a lot of these works really do float in this sense of timelessness. Um, there aren't a lot of, well, a lot of her figures are nude. They're not clothed um, for the most part. So it's not easy to place these historically, um, even though they might be figurative, which I think is 
quite interesting. Well, it's a, it looks like a fascinating show at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. Patricia Lee, thank you so much for thank taking you. us through it. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thanks for watching this episode of The Creative Community, and thanks again to our friends at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. The Creative Community, as always, is brought to you by a generous grant from the Diana and Simon Robb Foundation. I'm David Starkey, and thanks for watching.